Good evening. I'm Paris Alston. Welcome to The State of Race, a series of forums examining the state of racial equity in Massachusetts. Tonight, GBH World, the Boston NAACP branch, and the Boston Globe partner on Embrace Changemakers, then and now, live from the GBH studio here at the Boston Public Library and the Newsfeed Cafe and virtually on GBH's YouTube channel. Please send us your questions and comments either on cards here at the library or from home using the Q&A option on your devices. Statues, monuments, and other tributes to the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and increasingly Coretta Scott King are being created in cities across the country and around the world. And now there's one in Boston. A 40,000 pound bronze sculpture entitled The Embrace was unveiled on Boston Common in January as the center of a larger monument. GBH News was there to cover the unveiling ceremony. As I view this magnificent sculpture, I'm reminded of Dr. King's words, we are all tied together in a single garment of destiny. If I had to summarize it in one word, what I'm feeling in this moment, gratitude. Probably most of all. As a child, we will always come to the commons. We always see statue of Paul Revere and all these other great but now we get to see a statue dedicated to this great to be able to create a piece that acknowledges the history of people of color here acknowledges the history of martin and coretta that they met here they fell in love here they started a mission here and i think the hope is that it becomes a call to action to see the change we want to see in society we wanted to be here to be active to again be inspired so we do our actions for for racial quality in our lifetime. I think we need to see more love in this world and this really brings out the love. It's a wonderful um, reminder of the good that comes when we build community and when we turn to each other rather than on each other. For far too long we've seen our fellow man proceed as if we're in a zero-sum game. Heads you win, tails I lose. In Boston, we now have a daily inspiration to buck that trend and do better. Now let's act upon it. Ah, what a special day that was. And in the days following the unveiling, there's no doubt that there was a lot of conversation and debate about the embrace in Boston and comments that flooded in from across the country. Now, it's not surprising that any major historical monument would inspire heated discourse about its impact worthiness and place in history. And of course, the embrace is no different. So joining me to discuss this more is Ja D. Amazi, principal of Mass Design Group and an architect of the embrace and, and one of the folks involved in the design of it. Also with us is Amari Paris Jeffries, executive director of Embrace Boston. Tanisha Sullivan, president of NAACP Boston, who is also on the GBH Board of Advisors, and Adrian Walker, associate editor and columnist at the Boston Globe. Thank you all so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yes, of course. So, Amari, I want to start with you because I know you've had quite the month since January 13th. Oh, I was about to cry watching that video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us, tell us what, what has uh, life been like for you in that time, but also how have you been sort of processing everything that has happened in the moment since that in the moment since that day well you know it's always um, humbling and and um, 
really joyful to be here with all of my friends on, on this panel and uh, thank you and thank GBH for her having me and having us to talk about the embrace. You know, reflecting on the month afterwards, you know, I, I, one of the things I remember the most is hearing the stories of elders uh, and the children of some of the folks that we honored on the memorial and how excited and joyful and humbling it was to know that we were stewarding the legacy of these other 65 distinguished Bostonians uh, alongside of the Kings. And so that's been one of the things that has bring me the most joy through this process. And so um, I think also, you know, being able to built this memorial as a symbol of hope for our city and to have it be in America's oldest public park, to have it be a memorial to remind us that Beacon Hill was America's, one of America's oldest black neighborhoods. And so it's a memorial for those lost families in this community who were displaced. And that's one of the things that King uh, and others fought for, the idea of housing being a fundamental right of people. And so I think we're still struggling with housing being one of the fundamental um, civil rights issues of today. So, Tanisha, of course, there is an expectation that public art is going to incite opinions, right? And this one undoubtedly has. I mean, it has made the rounds all across social media, even made it to The Tonight Show with <laughs> Leslie Jones, right? I mean, how does that stack up with the feedback you were expecting to get uh, as a result of this, the unveiling of this monument? Yeah, I think it's really important um, for folks to remember that we made a conscious decision here in Boston um, in, in advancing the embrace for it to be public art, mm -hmm. right? And when we think about public art at its root, it is our hope that it will um, spark and inspire discourse, public discourse, and indeed that is what we've seen happen. Uh, and I think that's a positive thing, uh, especially when we're talking about this particular monument. It is a monument to two civil rights leaders, specifically Sir global leaders, and then another 65 local Boston-based um, civil rights leaders. We want folks to engage in conversation, um, not just about the individuals, but about the work um, mm -hmm. that those individuals sacrificed to advance um, and the impact that that work even has still today. Mm -hmm. And we are going to dig deeper into that. Uh, and before we do, Ja, I want to get your take as well, because in the, er the words of Erica Badu, right? One's an artist and they are sensitive about their you know what yeah. uh, but I'm curious because you were part of the design team I mean to have something out there in the world that is then uh, released to the wild to mm -hmm. be interpreted in all sorts of ways as we've seen how, how has that been for you I mean honestly it's been beautiful because all of it is a response all of it is people taking time out of their days out of their motions to be able to contribute to this overall conversation about the impact of art, the uh, participati participation that's necessary for public discourse, understanding that we are changing as a society the ways in which we look at monuments and memorials and memorialization, the ways in which we take up public space to expand our narratives and to share stories. And so being able to witness folks interpreting it in the ways that they are, having conversations, having debates, some healthy, some unhealthy. I think it's all really beautiful and it's really inspiring to me as someone who was part of the design team to see the impact that this type of work can and should have. So it's it's been remarkable, honestly. You know, Adrian, what Ja is saying is making me think about, I mean, you've had such a long and storied career here in Boston. You've seen the city change quite a bit. You've seen the how new leadership has come in as a result of some of those changes. And I'm wondering from you, I mean, how does the way that this has been interpreted in all its different ways stack up to, to how Boston is perceived to the, re to the rest of the world, and especially black Boston. Yeah, you know, first of all, I want to say that I think it's an incredibly healthy debate, and I've really enjoyed watching it unfold. But you know, it's interesting though that one of the, as criticism began to come in from outside of the city, one of the things we started hearing right away was this sort of tapping into Boston's reputation for racism. Of course, mm. Boston would do this, thi this terrible thing. And you know, it's, it's something that the city is still struggling to move past. But I think this memorial, first of all, we're in an area we're in an era where memorials are such an important debate. We're having them all over the country. And 
in that sense, it couldn't be more timely, both the debate and the sculpture itself. I'm glad it's there, I'm glad it's on the common, and I'm glad it's now part of Boston. So we have a question uh, from someone in the audience. R. Wayne Parrish uh, in Sudbury, Massachusetts, is asking, who oversees and approves any new monuments? So Amari, can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> you know, and it really depends on where um, someone is building a monument in the city of Boston. Um, so we had to get approval from three different uh, commissions. And so because it's in the Boston Common and it's such a historic area, so we had to get approval from the Landmarks Commission. Uh, both in the design of the piece, but also the the final approval of, of where it was located. Uh, we had to get approval from the Boston Arts Commission, and so they are the commission made up of artists and local civic leaders who approve public art throughout the city. Uh, and then lastly, because it's in a park and in America's oldest park, we had to get approval from the Parks Commission. Uh, and ultimately, they are stewarding the plaza, 1965 Freedom Plaza, where the Embrace sits mm -hmm. uh, in charge of the maintenance of the plaza itself. And so they were also one of the approving bodies uh, to get the Embrace mm -hmm. um, placed in this park. And it's important that folks know that this wasn't uh, just, you know, a design that came completely uh, from from a committee or anything like this. This was a competition that folks voted on, it right? It was, and we had a uh, worldwide call for proposals. There were 126 submissions, uh, five finalists, and uh, they were remarkable. And, you know, we called for a memorial of, of the Kings, and there were two of them that realized that Dr. King did not do this alone, mm -hmm. uh, and included uh, uh, Mrs. King Coretta in, in their submissions. And so those, those five finalists, people had an opportunity to vote in Pote's office and City Hall and online and in Boston Public Library. Uh, and the embrace unanimously won. And we had a committee of art leaders who were vetting the process, right? And, and really talking about and thinking about the feasibility of the project as well. And so it was a community process, community vote, and the embrace ended up being our, our winning submission. Oh, how about that? And Tanisha, I mean, you know, part of this discourse has been folks saying, okay, well, the king's faces aren't there. Uh, we see parts of their bodies, but not their whole bodies. Um, and, and, and people saying, well, what's up with that? Why is that? I mean, and we have a question from an audience member who's asking whether the artists or the team had any hesitation to create a bold image like this one um, to sort of go in this unconventional style that Hank Willis Thomas is known for, right? So talk about the reason why this this design, I mean, Amari did, of course, talk about it winning a competition, but tell me a little bit more about the idea behind the sculpture itself and how uh, that may or may not have worked in some cases. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll take the first part and then would love to hear from Ja on, on this as well from a design standpoint. Again, I think it's it's important, especially in the era that we find ourselves, um, really a transition period as we're experimenting with what public art can look like. I think it's important first to acknowledge that this was very intentionally designed to be art, okay? Um, which is different than what we traditionally, what we've become accustomed to seeing when we're talking about the memorializing of people. Usually folks are used to seeing more statuesque mm -hmm. style, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about it in terms of art, um, I think it is important um, to, to realize that it's a conceptual piece of art and people are gonna have all different types of interpretations. That said, we also here in Boston recognize that this wasn't just like any old kind of art, this is about racial justice and civil rights. And so to that point, I will say, I actually believe that some of the, the critique through a social justice and racial justice lens relative to this piece, um, to this piece I think it's, 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 legit, it's a legitimate critique. And I think it's important for us to, you know, have conversations about, in the historical perspective, right, what did it mean, what does it mean for black people to be dismembered? What, what was, what, what tools, how has that been used as a tool of oppression, mm -hmm. for example, right? Um, but here again, it's like, it's a, it's a loop. Right, yet another opportunity for us to have a conversation about race, racism, um, and really the, the evolution um, of the racial justice movement. Mm -hmm. And John? So I would, yes, I would add to that that if anybody is familiar, or even those that aren't familiar with Hank's work, it is 
a lot of it is rooted in interpretation, right? And taking 2D imagery and beginning to pull apart the layers of what one does not see. What else is there? What else is happening in that moment? And so Hank and our team was very much inspired by this photograph of the kings embracing one another the night that MLK finds out that he's going to be a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And in that photo, it's very obvious that there is love, there is compassion, there is support, there is excitement, but ultimately it looks as if Coretta Scott King is actually holding up MLK in that photo. And so Hank really wanted to capture that moment and celebrate that moment, and in doing so, wanted to have a conversation about their love and ultimately how that love fueled a movement. And so when we talk about the Kings and we talk about their history and we talk about the ways in which they impacted the civil rights movement, the conversation was a lot of that is possible by way of their love. And then ultimately that becomes a conversation about, well, how do we talk about love in public spaces? How do we talk about joy, black love and black joy in public spaces? And then I think the last thing I would add to that is that it was also very important for our team to begin to step away from this notion of singular hero worship, which is the statuesque that you're referring to in terms of what we as a society are accustomed to seeing in our monuments. It's always the likeness of an individual. And for us, we were focused on collective action and being able to understand how do we memorialize a movement as opposed to just an individual, right? And so that's where a lot of uh, what we see on the common comes from. It's, it's that level of thinking. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, the, just by nature, the, the, the way that the monument is shaped, right, is, is meant to envelop everyone who yes. comes to it. I mean, for folks who haven't been down there, um, it really is meant to wrap its arms around you as well. Now, in, in addition to the, the criticism, right, I mean, we've heard plenty of praise from folks like Governor Healy, Mayor Wu, Andrea Campbell, um, A.G. Campbell, and a number of other people. And of course, on the other side, there has been pe some people who really feel close ownership feeling um, insulted and, and, and feeling like this just isn't representative of the way that they knew the Kings. And one of those people has a very close relationship. Um, during an interview with CNN, Seneca Scott, who is uh, the cousin of Coretta Scott King, said the statue was insulting to his family and one view of the sculpture had sexual overtones for him. And he's also quoted as saying that it is a joke. Amari, uh, what, what's your response to that? You know, I think part of the opportunity with the, the, the comments and the feedback after the embrace is that we had an opportunity to name uh, the anti-blackness inherent in some of the discourse. Um, and, you know, we, in the course of these two weeks, and across the spectrum, one level of anti-blackness was to refer to this monument using a racist trope, right? And then the other end, um, you know, we see the police killing of Tyree Nichols, right? Also anti-blackness. And we see folks of color also engaged in it, right? Because it surrounds us all over the place. Part of the story with Seneca, Seneca and I ended up through the kind of letters and interviews, we ended up connecting and we had a, a phone call, 90 minute phone call to, to talk about uh, his feelings, his thoughts, or his initial reactions. And um, so the, the team at Embrace Boston is slated to go to Oakland at the end of the month on his invitation to visit the Black Joy and participate in the Black Joy Festival in Oakland. Uh, and we've invited him to our festival, the Embrace Ideas Festival. And so this idea to name the discourse, to lean into the conversation, Mrs. King's notion of a beloved community, to not approach uh, um, disagreement with bitterness, uh, and I think that's what happened with our conversation. I think part of some of uh, his his later comments was that he was feeling a sense of grief and, and emotion that, you know, and he felt compelled to say this. Mm -hmm. And so it comes to find out they're doing some interesting things in Oakland that we're doing. They also have a festival. They're also into food insecurity. They're also into thinking about harm, the seven harms of racism. They're doing almost the exact thing that we're doing at Embrace Boston. And so we, he was also, he's also a veteran. I'm a veteran. Uh, we had so much in common that, you know, I said, something like, I got to go, right? And we were on the phone for so long. And so I, I think leaning into this opportunity uh, instead of 
um, approaching the, this discourse with bitterness as part of the opportunity that the conversation has presented itself. We're in the middle of a culture war, yeah. and so of course the embrace would be an embodiment of love would, would bother people, would make people frightened. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I mean, it's like you're, you're bridging East Coast, West Coast divides. They should have called you in the 90s during <laughs> the Iraq culture wars, right? Uh, but that, but that, I'm glad that you two were able to connect and that it sounds like you're, you're going to keep that bridge mm -hmm. going. And Adrian, I, I'm curious from you, uh, do you think that some of the criticism comes from folks who maybe haven't gone down to see the monument in person yet? Or, or do you think that it's still open to that interpretation even if you are there? I mean, speak to a little bit about how it can be different versus if you're, you're looking at it, say, scrolling on Twitter versus actually being there. All I can say is that my experience of it was completely different seeing it in person than it had been in seeing a couple of years of photographs of it. And as I wrote, I think part of that is just the mass of it. it you kind of can't get the full sense of it from a picture. And to see it, you know, firsthand a couple of days before the unveiling, it was much more powerful to me. It had a power to me that, it, that pictures had never conveyed. So I think people will have a different sense of it when they actually see it face to face. Mm -hmm. And Amara, you had mentioned something um, about, you know, anti-blackness in, in terms of how this monument was being interpreted and discussed. And it made me think about an interview that we had on GBH News shortly after uh, in the unveiling in the midst of all of sort of the, the discourse um, with we spoke with Sebastian Smee, who is an art critic at the Washington Post, um, and we also spoke with Thaddeus Miles, who is a local photographer here. Uh, and one thing that I talked about with Sebastian was, I mentioned that Leslie Jones bit, I believe earlier I said she was the Tonight Show, you did. but it's the Daily Show. It is. Listen, I caught myself, yeah, well, yeah. I, I appreciate you holding me accountable. <laughs> I was already thinking about it. Um, but in that bit, she turns at one point and she says, she turns to a different camera angle and she's saying, She's speaking to the, white, the uh, proverbial white audience and just says, keep your hands off of this, right? Stay out of this. And, and Sebastian and I were uh, upfront about that moment and he even said, well, yeah, I understood, I know, but, but this is public art after all. And so Tanisha, I, I'm wondering from you, I mean, have, have you thought about that part yeah. of this at all? Not only the gaze on the sculpture, but mm -hmm. on, again, Black Boston. Yeah. No, this is great. Adrian and I just had this conversation pre-show. Um, because it's, well, I do think it's important, um, again, public art, okay? And so that means that it belongs to everybody. Um, and some people are going to like it, some people are going to love it, some people are going to be kind of agnostic as it relates to it. And all of that is okay, right? Um, from a racial justice standpoint, for me, what's most important um, is as we engage in the discourse, like it, love it, agnostic, um, mm -hmm. that we actually get to doing the work, mm -hmm. yes. right? Um, you know, because at the very beginning, this was always supposed to be, it's a monument plus, Right? When we talk about honoring the legacy of the kings, it's about your sleeves are rolled up and you're doing the work really helping to address poverty in our communities, helping to address the housing crisis in our communities, helping to improve quality of life for historically marginalized people. Um, and so for me, what my hope is, again, like it, love it, agnostic, is that from a humanity standpoint, it evokes in people a desire to do more, mm -hmm. to truly do the work of the kings mm -hmm. and not just talk about the work of the kings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that, but I also want to say something. You know, Sebastian is <laughs> a friend of mine and a former colleague at the Globe, and he's a brilliant art critic. Now, I happen to disagree with what he wrote about the embrace, but I think it's important mm -hmm. to say again and that- And we should say for anyone who hasn't seen it, he essentially said it, it just he, didn't work. He essentially said it was a well-intentioned misfire. I think mm. would be a fair summer. And uh, like I said, I disagree with him, but it's, it, you know, again, it's a healthy debate. We can have differences of opinion. Mm -hmm. We all come to art, all art, right? With our baggage and our lens and everything we bring to it. And we're not always going to agree. And some people look at a Picasso and go, that's crazy. <laughs> and some people see it's a masterpiece, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's fine. You know, we don't have to fear the disagreement. We don't have to fear the debate. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the conversation on the art is a distraction, right? There are 748 Confederate monuments. Half of those 748 monuments were built between 1902 and 1908, mm -hmm. well after the Civil War. And it, part of those monuments were really to reframe the Lost Cause movement, to re-characterize these individuals. There are nine military bases 
named after Confederate leaders, there are 240 schools named after Confederate leaders. Mm -hmm. The sixth most memorialized person in the country is Robert E. Lee, 13th is Jefferson Davis, and number 43 is Nathan Bedford Forrest, founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Monuments exist to tell a story, mm -hmm. and getting distracted with the art prevents us to tell the story of the art, to tell the story of what it, we want it to be. Uh, and I think we have to control that narrative, and I think we have, as Bostonians, done that. And um, we have a right to um, be protective of our city and our city's memorials and monuments because there's a story that we're trying to tell about Boston. I think Tanisha's been working on this for years, Adrian's been working on this for years, you've been working on this for years as journalists. Uh, there's a perception of Boston that's not true, hmm. uh, and we're in the middle of a transformation, and so it's up to us to tell the story of what the embrace means to us and not for others to tell it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to mention that I attended Robert E. Lee Jr. High in Miami. It's since been renamed. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to school, I went to undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill where there, were, there's, there are plenty of, of buildings named after Ku Klux Klan leaders. There's been, you know, in the news, yeah. student protests against Confederate monuments, so. Mm -hmm. sure. Right, and so, but I, I would be, I, ha I have to say this piece. If, when we're, again, from, when we're looking at these issues through a racial justice lens, when we are delving into racial justice work, and I think rightfully so, leaning into the use of art, whether it is, you know, a public piece of artwork like this one, or it's music, or it's dance, right? When we lean into the use of art to help advance racial justice, I think it is important for us to leave space for differences of interpretation mm -hmm. to Adrian's point and not feel and I say this as you know as a Bostonian right and not necessarily feel the need to defend or protect but just allow things to be mm -hmm. you know there's freedom in that right rather than us as Bostonians feeling like we have to carry the weight of you know being on guard but it, you know being free to have differences being free to engage in dialogue respectfully Right, mm. um, but also doing it in a way, and I'm gonna come back to this time and time again, doing it in a way that helps to advance quality of life for mm -hmm. folks, helps to make things better, helps mm -hmm. to actualize truly the legacy of the kings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so lastly, really quickly here, Ja, I wanna talk to you a little bit about, I mean, I know that as time goes on, our interpretation of art changes, right? I mean, Amari was talking about how we are reckoning with a lot of these Confederate monuments across the nation. We know that the Vietnam War Memorial in DC was one that was disliked in the beginning, and now it's, it's, it's something that people are drawn to. Do you think that'll happen with the embrace? It already has. Of course it's going to happen, right? Because it's about time, it's about context, it's about healthy dialogue and disagreement and discourse. It's about moments like when we see folks gathering to honor Tyree Nichols just, you know, a few weeks ago. It, it, it has to do that. That is what it is meant to do because it is public art and in that way, the public is going to have an opportunity to decide ultimately how it wants to engage with the work and with the piece. But when you think about the levels of intentionality, the thought, the community, the um, desire to shift the narrative that went into this work, ultimately it, it has to do that. It has to, has to become that place of transformation. Well, we will look forward to all of that evolving uh, in, the, in the years ahead and, and just seeing what story the embrace and folks' interaction with it continues to tell. Well, one powerful aspect of the Embrace Monument is that it lifts up 69 names of leaders who have carried the torch of change for racial and economic justice in Greater Boston. The memorial honors justices, artists, scientists, educators, and other civil rights advocates from 1950 to 1970 who embrace the vision of the Kings. Jose Massal, Chief of Human Services for the City of Boston, talks about a few of those leaders from the past who inspire him today. The historical significance of the 65 names at the Freedom Plaza, at the foot of the embrace, is to be able to walk and learn the stories 
of those that were before us. It allows us to be able to pass on these stories to our children and future generations to say that these are the leaders in the city of Boston that were able to uh, fight the good fight to make way for the things that we're able to do today. Amongst the 65 that had a huge influence on my work, I mean, I could name you know, probably a good 50 of them, but however, just bringing it down to, to a few, I would say that just knowing the work and the organizing work of Chuck Turner, uh, for example, and the work that he did on the community level and of course in the city council level. Uh, Mildred Haley is another one I would definitely uplift in the work that she did. Um, and I knew, you know, personally when I was a community organizer and I seen the work that she did in, um, in Bromley Heath and how she advocated for that community um, and fought fiercely to make sure that, you know, residents in that community had what it is that they deserved. Frida Garcia is another one. I think just knowing the work that she did, you know, for the South End uh, community and uh, the Latino community as well. And most importantly, you know, in the work that she did in United South End Settlements. And Mel King, speaking of United South End Settlements, is another one. I think he's somebody not so much after I was able to like model a lot of the work that I did after, just in terms of his role in youth organizing and uh, youth development. And of course, him as a youth director for United South End Settlements and uh, being the first black man to run for mayor um, and just the work that he was able to do, I think was just once again, extremely important. Um, it really just led the way. And last but not least, of course, I'll share uh, my dad, uh, Jose Simaso III. Um, and with him, I was able to see it firsthand. I seen the advocacy, I seen the work, the passion that he did had day in and day out and it was unmatched and I seen it came from a sense of integrity and values and a value around culture, a value around family, a value around community in which he was able to uplift at every single juncture. And, and that was Jose Masso talking about uh, the leaders in his life and who inspire him past and present. And I had to correct, because sometimes I have a tendency to put like this Brazilian accent of words like Masso. It's Masso, not Masso. I know the elder Masso would get on to me, pick on me about that. But in any event, joining us to talk about Changemakers past and present is Sharon Scott Chandler, the new president and CEO of ABCD, mm -hmm. Action for Boston Community Development. Sharon, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So Amari, first I just want to ask you to tell us about the thinking behind the Freedom Plaza at the foot of the Embrace Monument and why these particular 69 names were chosen. Yeah, you, you know, I think when we went from Dr. King to Mrs. King, you know, we, we knew that they were hidden figures uh, who, who did the work that were not being acknowledged. Uh, the Kings met here in the 50s, but he was inspired by Bostonians who were doing the work before he got here and when he arrived here as a young person. And there was an ecosystem of leaders who were inspired by his work after his final um, appearance in Boston at the 1965 Freedom Rally. And so we wanted to acknowledge this whole community of leaders and activists who were from Boston, some known, some not so well known, folks like Bob Moses, Mel King, UB Jones, Melnia Cass, and others. And uh, it was a difficult process to choose the names. And you know, we have some friends who, who helped us choose the names, but similar process where we had voting stations, um, in churches and faith-based institutions and post offices and libraries online. We, we had ads in the Bay State Banner and people could tear the ad out and place it somewhere, mail it back to us or deliver it or we'll, we would come pick it up. Um, and so it was a tough decision to get down to 65 names and you see that we kind of landed a little bit over 65 and um, you know we could have added more names than that and um, it was a it was a tough decision to do but we wanted to make sure that everyone we what we acknowledged on the plaza that we had their permission uh, it was important to get that that okay from the people or their families or loved ones if we were going to acknowledge them and we ended up um, settling on on these names mm -hmm. and is there do you will other names be added as time goes on you think or do you think this is going to stick with this sort of initial class well there's an app um, associated with the embrace for what we refer to as an eyes up digital experience uh, experience where the biographies of those individuals are on the app um, our intention is to honor more bostonians and really connect the 1965 freedom plaza uh, the the embrace center which will be located in roxbury to the embrace uh, in in boston common uh, so so every year we want to unveil a new set of leaders and have their names enshrined throughout our city. God, it sounds good. Well, one of our leaders today in the city, Shigun Iduwu, also talked about past leaders who inspire his work today.
There are several individuals who I had the greatest privilege of any person in the city to grow up around, to be around, to uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just be around as a young kid learning from them. Reverend Dr. Michael Lee Haynes, um, who as a young child uh, helped to nurture me and grow me uh, into who I am today. Second is um, Paul Parks, um, the late great, who uh, sort of adopted me as, uh, as just another little uh, grandchild of his um, and who, as I was uh, getting older um, and starting to kind of stray away from the path that my parents and grandparents uh, put me on, uh, was someone who encouraged me to uh, keep, uh, keep my head on, on my shoulders and to keep going. Third person I'll recognize is Clara Bell. Um, I have to say, of all the names that are on the plaza, I am most especially happy that her name is there. For more than five decades, she has served as the main secretary at Talk Baptist Church. So to see someone who in any other account uh, would be an unsung hero whose name would be relegated to the footnotes of history, uh, to see her lifted up in that way is incredibly meaningful, not just for 12th Baptist Church, but I think for all uh, who are helping, uh, again, make this city what it is today. But of course, uh, the, the last name that I'll mention, I could not be more proud, and especially on the day that the embrace was unveiled, where I was there with my grandmother, Frances Lawson, and my mother, Rachel Idawu, uh, as we celebrated the acknowledgement of my grandfather, the Reverend Earl W. Lawson, um, who uh, was uh, a graduate of Morehouse College, uh, 1945, and it was during his time there that he met a young little boy at that time named uh, Michael King, later to become Martin Luther, and it was their friendship that allowed for my grandfather to, alongside Virgil Wood and Vernon Carter, both who were also uh, named on this plaza, uh, to serve as the chief lieutenants of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference here in uh, Boston. Um, they helped to organize the 1965 march that brought King here uh, to the Boston Common and then to the state uh, legislature. Um, but more than that, my grandfather, uh, as a pastor in Malden over Emanuel Baptist Church, uh, and his work uh, to help uh, particularly uh, black men deal with uh, addiction, whether to drugs or to alcohol, um, his work to nurture the next generation, all of these things um, are what make me who I am um, and proud of him and his legacy uh, and puts an incredible weight on my shoulders to carry that forth. And that was Shigan Iduwu uh, from the city of Boston talking about the leaders who inspire him today. And Amar, we had an audience question from someone who's asking where they can find out more information about these, these 69 names. The, the best place is to go to stories.embraceboston.org and there are wonderful pictures and bios of those uh, 69 leaders. Wonderful. So Sharon, we have an audience question from David Dow, uh, who is asking about younger activists, the activists of today. Um, how to support them and create social justice and equity um, for them and inspire them to do that in our, quote, follow the money society? What do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> I say, I think, uh, first of all, visiting the Embrace Monument will give everyone a real inspiration around what we can do for one another. Um, and, I, and I'm amazed at, at how much activism there is. I think that we're at a moment similar to the 50s to 70s where um, there's a lot of uh, visible turbulence, there's a lot of uh, the pandemic, the George Floyd murder, many things that have spotlighted uh, the systemic racism and the other things that, that sort of got went a little bit more under the radar for many of society. And so um, I think that getting active, uh, there are many organizations that people can get involved in, even if they're following the money in their own job. There are a lot of uh, organizations. I say give back and come work for organizations like ABCD who are really trying to um, give people opportunity, trying to create community, uh, trying to develop leaders uh, in the anti-poverty work and in, in uh, social justice movement. And, and, and who are some of the leaders who inspire you, Sharon, whether they're on the Freedom Plaza or, or other folks? Uh, well, uh, ABCD has such a connection really to the Freedom Plaza. First, um, Melnia Cass was an original incorporator of ABCD in 1962, and she uh, is known as the First Lady of Roxbury, uh, coming here from the South and uh, really fighting for domestic workers' rights and, and giving women, uh, women of color, particularly black women, uh, opportunity and, and protection and 
in doing so and in creating ABCD, she really led the way. She was one of the first black women um, who was part of uh, the anti-poverty movement. Another leader is Bob Cord, similar. He, Melnia Cass actually hired Bob Cord back in 1964, so there's a connection there to ABCD. Bob Cord uh, was the CEO of ABCD for more than 40 years. He really uh, developed it as an opportunity for people to uh, work in community, develop leaders, uh, fight poverty from the ground. And he was a mentor of mine. I was fortunate to work with him for over 10 years, and I'm proud to, I know he would be proud of me uh, becoming the CEO of ABCD uh, in July. And one more I'd like to squeeze in, uh, Jean McGuire. Mm. Um, uh, not only because she was the first black woman school committee member, but she was the longtime executive director of METCO, and I'm a product of METCO. Um, and so way back when, she really, um, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have her leadership, her support. I remember her in the METCO office years ago, just encouraging all of us as young kids, do the best you can, uh, be who you are, uh, be yourself, uh, strive for excellence. And she's just an incredible, incredible role model. Uh, the list goes on, oh, yeah. uh, you know, about so many. For a long time. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I'm curious from Adrian, Tanisha, and Amari as well, who are some of the leaders you would name? You know, one person I was really glad to see was Byron Rushing, a longtime uh, state rep from the South End. You know, he's just like an incredible, first of all, he's a great activist, progressive politician, but also such a great Boston historian, you know. Mm -hmm. If you want to know anything about the history of Roxbury, Byron Rushing is the person to call. And he is a person who has poured his heart and soul into this city for 50 years, and I'm glad he's there. And continues to do it. And continues to, yes. And continues to do it. So, you know, for me, what, um, again, all the name, all the names, right? Um, and, and most importantly, the work, okay? Um, but I have to lift up the women. You know, I, I do, you know, we, as Josh shared earlier, you know, the fact that this piece includes um, very equally Coretta Scott King is not by accident. You know, throughout the civil rights movement, throughout the racial justice movement, women have played such an important strategic role um, in our advancement, not just supporting you know, uh, the ideas of men, but actually being the innovators and the strategists um, that have gotten us to where we are. And so for me, um, it is so um, inspirational and ins inspiring to have so many women uh, on the plaza today. You know, um, Ruth Batson, for me, uh, certainly I'm president of the NAACP Boston branch, right? And um, the work that Ruth Batson did um, throughout her life, but specifically as it relates to public education and ensuring that our children all have access to a quality public education in the city of Boston. It is her work serving as um, the chair of education for the NAACP Boston branch that led to the organizing movement of families across the city that ultimately resu resulted in the desegregation of Boston public schools. Um, and she went on to, 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 to lead METCO as well. Um, you know, I think about Glendora Putnam, um, uh, an attorney in her own right, um, someone who I have admired for years. Um, she would be 100 years old this year. Um, Lindora Putnam, the first black woman to serve as an assistant attorney general here in Massachusetts, working right alongside us, the late Senator Edward Brooke. Um, Glendora Putnam was just a silent, fierce um, advocate for all people, um, and um, especially black folks and especially women. She was a leader in the YW movement as well, served as president for many, many years. Um, and again, the, the list certainly goes in, on and on, but the women um, on this monument, um, for me as a woman in this movement, acknowledging that for them to do, to have the impact that they had, um, they had to endure not only racism, but sexism. Um, and yet, they thrived. Um, and so, 
th that part to me is, is what really does stand out. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk more about that with you and both Sharon as well. Mari, uh, quickly though, what, what, who are the leaders who inspire you? You know, definitely Hubie Jones and Mel King. Uh, Hubie is one of my dear, dear mentors. And some of my other mentors are also his mentees. And so in a, in a sense, Hubie's my grand mentor, uh, if you will. <laughs> uh, he and I go to lunch every six weeks. And, um, you know, I, I get more in a lunch with Hubie Jones and I've gotten in my bachelor's master's degree combined and so it's, it's just been a, a blessing to uh, have him as a friend and uh, a, a really leader in the city but someone to learn from I think one of the things that Hubie told me early on is that you have to build real community um, and for folks who, who know me uh, and many may at this table who've been at to my house Hubie said you got to bring people into your real home uh, if you don't bring, bring people into your real home, then they're just work friends, and you can't do work with work friends, especially the work that we do. And so I think just about every, most of the folks at this table have been to my real home. Uh, I have been there. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Will Soon. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Will Soon. All right, we're all going to dinner tonight. <laughs> that, was, that was Hubie, and, and you remember Mel, Mel used to have Mel King used to have the the the, mm -hmm. the breakfasts the at Sunday his brunch. Sunday mm -hmm. brunch, and oh, anyone yeah. could come through, uh, and so that's something that I that I took to heart that I that I tried to do and embody, and and it's you know it's been something that. Uh, um, that I think many of us have tried to do is really welcome people in our in our authentic spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I try. I know you're going to invite you soon, especially now, right? I'd put you on blast in public and everything. Well, Sharon, as I mentioned, Tanisha was was talking um, about all of. of the impact of women in this movement. And we know that, that this is one of the few, and, and increasingly Coretta Scott King is being highlighted as we continue to memorialize the King's legacy. Talk a, bit, a little bit about how women lead. I mean, because we're, we're living in an era in the city where we have a woman mayor, right? The city's first woman of color mayor. We have uh, the first woman of color attorney general. We have the first woman openly lesbian governor uh, there in the state house. We also have a, a black woman congresswoman. And the, and, and we're seeing these shifts unfold, right? I mean, what's, what's that impact? I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but uh, we, we lead with, with nurturing and empathy and insight. And I think that I, I, I'm so excited that the list that you just named is what we have for the future of, of our city. And, and I think I look back or look into how I lead and how I, I give back, I learn from the lessons that we, we, we've learned, um, and I'm excited to see us really lead in a way that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I am certainly hopeful in what we see today. Uh, it, is, it is emblematic of the work that has gone in, this didn't just happen overnight, right? This has been decades long, generations long work of opening up doors for women and specifically for women of color. Again, we, we do um, endure both sexism and racism. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that we are where we are um, is, is hope uh, that has been manifested. That said, you know, again, the work continues because now that we are in these spaces, you know, we have to ensure to Sharon's point that it's not just about representation, but that we get to bring our whole selves, um, the fullness of that experience, our experiences, the fullness of the way in which we lead to help ensure that these structures that we're going into actually have the benefit of having women um, mm -hmm. in them, and that we do usher in culture shift and not just diverse representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, the I, think that, I think that word culture is really critical because one thing I will tell you from watching politics over a very long period of time is that faces change faster than culture does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is a lot of work left to be done. And, and say, uh, Sharon, I do want to hear uh, what you'd like to add, but, but really quick, well, Quickly or not, Adrian. <laughs> I know I keep. I don't I'll, want to rush you all, but I'll, I, I'm, I'll be quick. I, I'm curious. I mean, you know, we're we're seeing this, the city's leadership 
change, um, and it's, it's somewhat of a drastic change for many people in the city who have been used to a certain type of leadership, largely white and largely male for so long. Absolutely. So is the everyday culture of the city reflecting that yet? What, and if not, what will it take to get there? It is changing, but it's changing incrementally, and you know, it's all in the details, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's all in the outcomes, it's all in what really happens. Well, yeah. one thing I was going to mention is is that the face, since the face of leadership is different, many more people get to see women lead. I mean, as as a young black girl growing up, you know, I did have on on the monument you'll see those leaders, but that that wasn't widespread. That wasn't the larger community seeing those leaders who they now can read about. But now when you have a mayor, when you have the attorney general, when you have the governor, women leading, it's much more visible. We were so more so invisible to the broader community, our strengths, our, our, our skills, um, our leadership was much less visible. And, and now that we're in those positions, it's gonna be great for young people coming up and trying to do the same thing. Oh. And, you know, and one of the things I'll say, 45% of the names on the plaza are, are women. Um, so we, we, we try to ensure and, and not put our hand on the scale, you know, we, we try to accept the, the submissions as they came in, but 45% of them are women. I think it speaks to the committee that, that vetted those names and ensured that there was representation. Um, there's also indigenous names, uh, Asian names, uh, Jewish names, and, and uh, Latinx names. And the, the idea of, of this representation, Boston being one of America's storytelling city, it's, it's the mecca of Americana. Uh, and so people come here, they come to DC, they come to Philadelphia, they come to New York to go on their sacred pilgrimage to learn about who they are as Americans. And they walk on the Freedom Trail where the embrace is, right? And the embrace is in relationship to the Shaw 54th Memorial. And so we want them to learn about um, the, the heroes and leaders of the civil rights movement alongside of the heroes and leaders of uh, the, the liberation movement of the Civil War alongside of the, the Black Heritage Trail, which is uh, in Beacon Hill, where the Museum of African American History Museum is, the, the meeting house. And so these three memorials, these three trails are in conversation with each other. And so when people come here to get a story of America, they're gonna get an amazingly diverse, robust story of a city and its diverse leaders uh, when they come to Boston. And that was part of the intention uh, of including the names in the way that we did. Mm -hmm. And not to mention too, I mean, the Kings had such uh, such vast international appeal, right? Uh, they weren't just American figures. Uh, they were worldwide figures and we were a city of immigrants as well. And, and what you're speaking to about having um, not just people, not just leaders who are black, on that plaza, I think, speaks to that as well. And the app allows for folks who are hard of seeing or blind to experience the embrace and to experience the names. It's also translated into Haitian Creole, Spanish, and Mandarin. And so we want folks who come to the city, visitors and residents alike, to understand the importance of those folks in the language that is most comfortable for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as we're talking about these past leaders, it's making me think about today's leaders, right? I mean, we've, we've heard some names we've heard from uh, Shigun and Jose there, and, and we have all of you here as well. Um, but the, the day and age that we are living and defines activism differently, right? Um, you know, in the, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, we saw protests. We've, we've seen civil action following the death of Tyree Nichols. Um, but it, the activism is also different, been largely in part due to the internet, right, and due to social media. And I'm curious from each of you, how would you define activism today? Adrian, I'll start with you. Well, I will say that the nature of it has changed. You're absolutely right. Uh, largely because of social media. But the important thing is that the task is the same, right? The things you're fighting for are still the same. I think it is important to understand where we are in the movement. Um, you know, we fought for so long simply for the right to be in some in certain spaces, whether it was public spaces or in the workplace, right? And so we have now gotten to the point in our movement where we are sitting in these spaces and we are leading in some of these spaces. So the activism, I believe, has to shift. The question is not can we get in the door per se, but it is what 
are we able to do once we're there? Mm. What are we challenging ourselves to do once we're there? It's not, now it is about, yes, representation, but how does that representation then impact the policies and practices of the institutions that we're in? So that does require um, us to shift a little bit in how um, we activate. Um, and, and it also, I think, requires us to be intentional about learning how to be in these spaces, right? Because it is new for for us. We don't have, you know, role examples of folks who've been, you know, governor or you know, been mayor or what have you. Yeah, I think I think Tanisha is is absolutely right. I think what we do in those spaces is is part of the next challenge. Uh, I think we're in the midst of a culture war with technology that didn't exist uh, in the 60s and 70s. And I think so there there are some similarities in, in the fight, but there are the weapons, the tools are different. Uh, I think there's a different understanding, again, of, of the power of monuments. You know, monuments are analog cookies. Um, they, they exist, you know, I went online, I, I wanted to buy some shoes, I accepted the cookies, and all throughout <laughs> the day something told me I needed to buy some shoes, and I bought the shoes. And monuments exist in that way, too, and I think we understand that. We understand the power of monuments to convince us who belongs here and who doesn't, um, whose story needs to be told and deserves to be told and whose doesn't. And I, I think that's been part of the fight, and I think the embrace is Boston submission to, 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 that, to that part of the, the, the challenge, the activism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree with everything that's been said, and the only thing that I would add to is that we really are dealing with four generations, and so mm -hmm. activism looks so different for every generation, um, and, and as you said, there's social media, but there's, there's the traditional marching and protest. So how do we blend and bridge all of the activism that we all have from those four generations existing and build on that, capitalize on it, maximize it? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you each so much. I mean, there, there's so much we could continue to discuss here, and I'm sure that these conversations won't end here. I encourage everyone here in the library to keep the conversation going. Not too long, though, because, you know, it is a school night, uh, but also online uh, and, and, and in all the spaces when you come together with each other in person. I want to thank our guests, Amari, Tanisha, Adrian, Ja, and Sharon, for all being here. I've really enjoyed the conversation with you all. We also want to thank our audience here in the library for joining us and those who joined us online, as well as our partners at the NAACP, Boston Branch, and the Boston Globe. We also want to thank Embrace Boston. To find out more about the Embrace Sculpture and our civil rights heroes, make sure you download the app or visit stories.embraceboston.org. That's stories.embraceboston.org. Thank you. And join us for our next State of the Race event on March 16th. Sharon and Tanisha have me really excited about this. So it's going to be ladies' night. I hope they play that song while we're walking into the library. It is titled Women of Color Rising. You can find more information by visiting our State of Race page on gbh.org. Hi, everyone. I'm Elijah Farron from GBH's Local Marketing Department. We're glad you could join us during tonight's discussion. Important programs like the State of Race are made possible by GBH members, people like you who support GBH and World's Channel's commitment to respond, to represent, and to include the diversity of our community in the work we create and how we do that work. Your support helps World Channel to continue to showcase multicultural filmmakers and storytellers who are reporting from the heart of their communities. Help us raise visibility and further conversations around the issues that racial and ethnic communities face, like tonight's The State of Race discussion. Tonight, if you're able to give $5 a month as a sustaining member, that's only $60 a year. We'll send you this GBH gray logo shirt to show our appreciation. Tonight, there are also three ways to give. Visit wgbh.org slash support events Text GBH to 800-204-3811 using keyword GBH to donate, or you can scan the QR code here to open the donation form on your screen on your smartphone.
there will never be a better time to give. So donate to GBH today because every dollar counts. By supporting GBH today, you are letting us know what matters to you. Out of all the news and information sources available, you turn to GBH, and that's why we're turning to you to ask for your support. Your support is vital to the GBH mission of offering insightful, objective, and necessary information to serve our audiences. Please consider becoming a member today. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you.